Hi, and welcome to the last Big Bang in the present series. This time, we're going for the big one. We've come out to the Big Bang Garden to show you around the entire universe. Later on in the programme, the Big Bang Space Pro will be exploring our own solar system and dropping in on a few neighbouring planets. And I shall be showing you how to make a simple reflecting telescope and we'll be taking a closer look at the moon. No, Kate, I'm from North Wales. It's just that I lived in outer space for a while. Yes, that explains a lot. Well, before we reveal the secrets of the stars, we have, as always, a trick. Now, Gareth, if I drop this ball at the top of this ramp, mm -hmm. which of those glasses do you think it's going to land in? I don't think there's any way you could predict that. You might miss them all together. Uh, well, I've trained this ball. I've trained it to go into the second glass along right Impossible. now. Impossible. You know what you've got to do. Yes. That is a fantastic bit of training, Kate. But what on earth has dropping ping pong balls into glasses got to do with space? Ah, what do you think it is that is keeping the Earth in the same orbit round the sun all the time? Strings and wire? It's gravity. And it's gravity that pulls the ball down the slope and through the air. And because gravity, the effect of gravity is always the same, if you release it at the same point, it'll always take the same path and always land in exactly the same place. That's how you trained your ball. Actually, um, my trick's got to do with training as well. I've trained the moon to change size. Don't believe you. All right, I'll prove it at the end of the programme. I just want to prove that this works too. Today's strange but true story is the entire history of astronomy in less than two and a half minutes. Are you ready? Go. First, 2,000 years ago, it was the Greeks who grouped stars together in constellations and gave them names like Scorpius or Orion the Hunter. The top Greek astronomer was a fellow called Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy believed that the Earth was the hub of the universe. Basically, the Earth was in the centre of everything and all the stars and planets revolved around the Earth. Now, people believed this for over 1,400 years until... Not so fast with that theory of the universe, Ptolemy. The next superhero astronomer on the scene was a Polish monk called Copernicus, or Copernicus to his friends. Now, Copernicus looked at the planets and reasoned that the Earth couldn't be at the centre of the universe. Take Mars. Imagine you're standing on planet Earth watching Mars travel across the night sky. If Mars circled Earth, then it would travel at a constant speed in a constant direction. However, if you watch Mars, it does a very strange thing. It starts going one way, stops, goes backwards, then goes forwards again. Now, Copernicus, sorry, Copernicus, knew that that kind of movement was impossible. There could only be one explanation, that Earth was moving too. And it was simply the relative speed and movement of the two planets which made it appear as if Mars stopped and could go backwards. Finally, Sir Isaac Newton. Now, he's the chap who discovered gravity. Gravity is the force which attracts apples and causes them to fall to Earth. Gravity is the cement of the universe. It's the force which attracts all the planets to each other and to the sun. Once astronomers knew about gravity, they could work out the orbits of all the planets and even predict the paths of comets. How about that, then? The entire history of astronomy in two minutes and 15 seconds. Thank you very much. The night sky is absolutely beautiful, but it's a bit of a mess. It's hard to find your way around the constellations without a map, but it would have to be a very clever map because the position of the stars seems to change as the Earth rotates. But I've got a very clever map. It comes in two parts. The bottom part has the constellations on it and the months of the year around the outside. And the top part has the hours of the day around the outside and a little viewing window. What you need to do is to find today's date on the bottom part. OK, got that. Then check the time uh -huh, and set the top ring so that correct time is lined up against today's date. Pin the two bits together. Then you're going to need a compass to find which way south is. Let's see now. OK, south is that direction. Now you see that you've got north marked on your star plotter. So face south and then point the star plotter towards the south. But this is the clever bit. Turn it upside down so the north and the star plotter matches up with the north behind you. 
Now, when you look at the star plotter, it will show you a number of constellations. And my star plotter is telling me that I should be able to see Orion, the constellation of Orion, round about there. And look, there it is. Beautiful, eh? I wonder if there is any life up there. There's billions of other stars in our own galaxy. At least some of them will be like the sun. There must be other planets. I suppose one of them could support life. Or maybe new life is being born at this moment, in the Orion Nebula, a cloud of gas lit by brilliant young stars born only a few tens of thousands of years ago. Perhaps one of those stars will become the centre of a group of planets, like our own solar system. And there's the rest of the universe, millions of other galaxies, all with billions more stars in them, and trillions more planets. Maybe there's someone up there looking at our own sun and wondering the same thing. Doesn't seem very likely, I suppose. I know that looks like London's planetarium, but for today, and for one day only, that is the sun. That green dome is a huge, white, hot, glowing ball of gas over 900,000 miles across, and where I'm standing is 6,000 Celsius. Better take my scarf off then. I'm space mad. I'd give up my signed photograph of Danny Minogue to get up amongst the planets, and today's my chance as I take the Big Bang space probe on an interplanetary mission. We're visiting all the planets, and each one will be exactly the right size compared to our planetarium sun. The distances we're going to travel between the planets will also be on the right scale. I wonder how far we'll have to drive. We've been travelling for a couple of minutes, and we've come a distance of about one Earth mile. But remember, that's about 36 million space miles. We're already approaching our first planet. Here it comes. It's Mercury tiny, isn't it, compared to the sun? But in fact, Mercury is 3,000 miles across. And at this speed, we'll be past it in the blink of an eye. Ahead, warp factor five. Engage. Our next stop is one of the strangest and unfriendliest planets in the solar system, Venus. Venus is covered in a very dense gas which presses down on the planet's surface like an enormous weight. So if we landed, we'd get crushed by that enormous weight, but not before we were sizzled by the sulfuric acid rain which pours down from the sky. Oh, Venus is a lovely place to visit, but we must fly. Thankfully, our next planet is more friendly. Not too hot, not too cold, with breathable air and water. Welcome to Hampstead Heath. If you like, planet Earth, the only place in the entire solar system which can support life. So we've definitely come to the right place. I've got the whole world in my hands. I've got the whole wide world in my hands. To get to the fourth planet from the sun, we're already going to have to leave London. Remember, all these distances we're travelling are on the correct scale. We've reached the bottom of the M1 now, and this is where Mars can be found. It's cold out here. Mars is a dry, dusty planet about half the size of Earth. No life has been found on Mars yet, but we haven't given up looking either. Next is the gas giant Jupiter. It's massive, so to show you Jupiter, we'll have to stop and get out. It's over 11 times wider than the Earth, but there's only a small solid bit of rock in the centre. The rest is gas. What we see are the clouds on top of a stormy 620 mile thick layer of hydrogen and helium. Onwards and outwards, our next planet is another giant. Saturn, like Jupiter, is made up almost entirely of gas and has many moons. We've travelled 26 miles from the planetarium now and I've arrived at Whipsnade Wild Animal Park. But in space terms, 
We've come 887 million miles from the sun, which is why it's so dark out here. But we've arrived at Saturn. Hang on a minute, there's something missing. Saturn's famous rings are made up out of bits of rock. And those bits of rock range in size from huge ice boulders to tiny dust particles. And they orbit the planet. When they catch the sunlight, they're beautiful. That's it. No more landings now until we reach the end of our journey. We're now approaching the outer planets of the solar system. This is Uranus, about four times the size of Earth. It has five main moons, and it's so far away from the sun, it takes 84 years to complete its orbit. Fantastic space probe, this. It gets a billion and a half miles to the gallon. We're almost there, and look how far we've come. Remember, our scale model of planet Earth was only the size of a football. We've come 84 Earth miles from the planetarium now, which is 2 billion 800 million space miles from the sun, which is where you find beautiful blue Neptune. The thing about Neptune is it's so far away from the sun that one year on this planet lasts 165 Earth years. And there it is, the furthermost planet in our solar system. We've been travelling at uh, twice light speed, which is about a billion miles per hour, for over two and a half hours. And where have we arrived? Centre Parks in Nottingham. Welcome to Pluto, the furthest planet in the solar system. It's a tiny rock. Actually, Pluto only shows up as a small blurred dot on most powerful of telescopes from Earth. And that's not surprising when you consider trying to see Pluto from Earth is the same as trying to see this rock from Hampstead Heath in London, which is over a hundred miles away. All the best telescopes are done with mirrors, and you can make yourself a simple reflecting telescope using these things. They're bathroom mirrors. I don't know if you've seen them before, but one side is flat like this, whereas the other side is slightly curved. So it magnifies the image, rather like a lens. What you'll need are two of these bathroom mirrors. One flat, and the other one with the magnifying side. What you have to do, and it's a bit tricky, is line up the mirrors so you can actually see a reflection of the moon in your flat mirror off the magnifying mirror. It takes a little while to do, but when you get it... OK, there it is. Then you're going to need a magnifying glass. If you look through your magnifying glass at the image in the flat mirror, you can get a really close-up image of the moon's surface. Wow, look at that. Well, have you got it working yet? Yeah, it actually works very well. Excellent! Aren't you clever? Well, it's now <laughs> time for Gareth's last trick, and it's the biggest trick of the series. Are you going to make the moon change size? Yeah, you can make it appear as if the moon's changed size. If you look at the moon tonight, like it is high up in the sky, it looks tiny. But some nights, when the moon is low in the sky, it appears much, much bigger. Now, there's a reason for this. When the moon is low in the sky, you're seeing it against trees or a house. And if the moon looks bigger than a tree or a house, and the moon's over 238,000 miles away, then your mind thinks that it must be big. Whereas when it's high up in the sky, you've got nothing to measure it against, so it looks tiny. You can actually check this. When the moon is low in the sky, Hold your thumb out at arm's length and measure how big the moon appears to be compared to your thumb. And then look again when it's high in the sky. Hold your thumb out and you'll see that the moon never changes size. It's just a trick. Oh, yes. That's it for this series of The Big Bang. Thanks for coming to see us. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.